Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the workshop. It's fantastic to have you here because on today's episode, I am going back to the roots where I have not ventured for a little while. That's right. You remember recently I made a hammer with the one, the only Jimmy DeResta. That was a special time. Let's have a little flashback to that. <laughs> Now let me tell you, that was an incredible amount of fun having Jimmy in the shop. He's just an incredible guy and it's, it's an honor. It was an honor. And so what I'm going to do today is we're going to finish off this hammer so that I can send it to him. He's been doing a lot of blacksmithing lately. So uh, I'm going to be excited to see him use this in some of his videos. So here we go, I started at 36 grit, and now we're at 120 grit. You'll remember, about this time last year, I made 70 of these in a row, in a really big little uh, little production run of the old workshop, which was a lot of fun. But you'll see, I've kind of developed a good technique for grinding these, that ends up with having faces with the geometry that I like, and also reduces the number of steps possible. So what you just saw me do, is hit the diagonal, then start with the eye up and do the face all the way up, side all the way up, the face all the way up, and then I'll finish sideways with the hammer and finish rolling it off. That gets me one consistent path from side to side without a facet like we have on the other direction because when we use the hammer, this is the side where we're angling more and this is where I want to avoid having any sort of hammer marks the most. Up to now, we've done almost all of the round face on the flat platen. We're gonna do a little more with the 120, mostly to break down the grit scratches at the top of the crown. But to be able to make it as smooth as possible, what I'm actually gonna do is rotate my platen around. That gets me the slack belt. So now as I apply pressure, it conforms to the round a little more. Now I'm gonna bring this all the way up on all of the faces to a 400 grit finish. So what I just did there is I took a carbide burr on a die grinder. When I'm installing the wood for the handle, I want to make sure that I'm not jamming the wood in and then having the metal cut into the wood, create a shoulder, and then have this physical barrier between getting that wood in there further, compressing it more, and getting more friction between the, the wood and the metal. So it's got this nice gentle radius, so as we drive the wood in, we're going to keep compressing it and getting as tight as physically possible. But first, we need to heat treat it. Now, I've heat treated hammers in all of the ways possible. I've heat treated hammers heating just the faces in coke and coal fires, heat treated hammers by heating the whole thing in coke and coal fires. I've heat treated hammers by putting the whole thing in a gas forge, doing the ends in a gas forge, using a torch. So there are plenty of ways to do it. The key, obviously, just like when we're making a knife, is we need to get it up to critical temperature where there is the phase change. Then we need to cool it down very fast. But this is different to a knife in the sense that we don't have an edge, we have a flat and rounded surface that needs to stay where it is, and the material that we're using is very different. Here, I'm using 1040 material. You'll remember that one of the steels in the Damascus that we make sounds rather similar, and that is 1080. That's because it is similar in the sense that they are both 
plain carbon steels, but not similar in the sense that the steel in the Damascus has 0.8% carbon, this has 0.4% carbon. This means that this will not get as hard. It also means that it's less liable to crack. It also means that instead of hardening in oil, we need to cool it down as fast as possible, otherwise it will not get hard, and so we're cooling it in cold water. I like to start on the round face when I'm heating it with the torch because what it does is it jets down the flame and it'll heat up the other side too much otherwise. And then into the water we go and you'll see I'm shaking it very vigorously. Now, there is something that happens called the Leidenfrost effect, which is very difficult to talk about while you're shaking it in the water. The Leidenfrost effect is where the hot object in the water is creating the steam jacket. That steam jacket, it's not conducting the heat out of the workpiece as fast as the cold water itself, so I'm gonna shake it around to make sure that we're putting fresh cool water on our nice hot steel to get it cooling fast. And right now, should be able to touch it. Absolutely. We can test it with a file. And that is exactly what we want. That file doesn't touch it. Here's another good test for the hardness. It wants to bounce in an extremely lively manner when it's hitting a hardened steel surface like the anvil. So we're gonna flip it around, do the same thing on the other side. Okay, it's cool. Glazes with the file, it's what we want. Now the interesting thing is, is now I've made a lot of hammers and I've used a lot of the hammers that I make. And with this particular steel, that's it. That's the heat treat, which is one of the reasons that I loved using it because I got fabulous performance out of the material with a really efficient and quick heat treat like that. I think when I was doing production runs of this, when Sam and I were quenching a boatload of these things, man, we, we moved through it fast. It doesn't take a lot of time to heat up the face. You heat up one face at a time, I like doing it that way. So now it's on to think about the handle for Jimmy's, uh, Jimmy's hammer here. This is some ash. My favorite handle material is hickory for hammers. It's a little harder, does a little better. The hickory stock that I have though, I don't have any nicely grained pieces. What I do have is this gigantic chunk of ash. The grain is running diagonally, however, so I gotta do something quite ridiculous. We gotta get a handle out of it like that. That looks absurd. This, this seems pretty ridiculous, but this is the plan. Woo! Hey, if it works, it works. Ah, there we go. So I have just scotch brighted the faces. And when I say scotch bright, I literally mean the exact same scotch bright that you scour pans with, what have you. It's the same stuff, it's on a mop. I believe this is a PTX wheel. Any good abrasive place should either have them like this or put together on a mop, kind of uh, similar to a buffing mop, but uh, with this material. And it's really rather lovely for doing that final little finish. It'll go through the scale from the torch, which is why I went up to the final grit finish at the belt sander before hardening it. I'm gonna get ready to oil this. Now, the thing is, is though I'm using the same scotch bright material, this is just a little bit less aggressive since I'm doing it by hand. And so I'm just gonna take off any of the loose bits of scale and then I'm gonna oil it up and work that in there. A little rub with a cloth. The hammer is now ready for the handle, which is right here.
Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm gonna send this off to Jimmy. In the meantime, go and check out his channel. If you don't know who Jimmy DeRester is, clearly you haven't spent enough time on YouTube, but you should check out his channel, especially the episode where he was here in the UK, because that's when he came to the workshop. Thank you, Jimmy, for stopping by. It was an honor and a pleasure to make this with you. I can't wait to see what you get up to in your own workshop as you, uh, as you start on in this little craft of blacksmithing. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you tomorrow.